I'm Pedro de Costa, Editorial Fellow here at the Peterson Institute for International Economics, and I'm joined by Bill Klein to talk about bank capital, which seems to be an evergreen subject in the, <laughs> in the evolving world of, of financial regulation. Now, you've recently written uh, a working paper for us called Benefits and Costs or Higher Capital Requirements for Banks, which pushes back a little bit on the notion that uh, that capital requirements don't have any cost to the broader economy. Could you speak to that a little bit? Right. Well, I mean, the Basel III reform, of course, did increase the capital requirements. But there are some academics out there who are saying way too little. We need yeah. much, more, much more capital. And so this examines that. And the academic argument is based on a couple of Nobel Prize winning economists, uh, uh, Modigliani and Miller, who in the 1950s said, well, whether you borrow or use equity doesn't make any difference. Mm -hmm. Because if you have more equity, you'll be safer. Uh, and so the unit cost of equity will go down. People will have a willingness to provide you equity capital at a cheaper rate. Well, previous paper I did last year tested that hypothesis for the banks and had found out that that so-called offset is only about one half. Uh, there are a lot of special features of banks. For example, the, the, their product is, is a debt, it's, it's deposits. Sure. But without going into that, um, my conclusion is that Bank capital is not cost-free to the economy uh -huh. because uh, the banks have to pay more if they use more equity and they raise their interest rates. That causes the cost of investment to go up. That means less capital in the long term and lower GDP in the long term. And so where does that leave uh, the current, for U.S. banks in particular, where do you see, where does your... Uh, research leave, you know, where does your research line up compared to where regulators are falling into their their standards? Are they too well, let tight? Me, let, let, or, let me tell you how I get there. I mean, the bottom line is that they don't, they're holding more capital than they're supposed to or than they have to, according to Basel III. They're holding about 7, 8% of their total assets as capital. They only have to hold 5%. And if you've used the so called risk weighted assets, these numbers are almost twice twice as high. But when you uh, say hold, they're not necessarily it doesn't prevent them from lending, it's just equity versus debt, right? Right. So if you if you compare their common tangible equity against uh, their total assets, uh, it's about seven percent. It Got turns it. out that that's at the bottom end of the range that I identify as optimal, okay. which is seven to eight percent of total assets. Um, and it's considerably above the Basel three. Uh, minimum of 5%. Uh, so I conclude that Basel does not have a high enough target. Uh, and that's, uh, it is true that the, the, the actual practice of the U.S. banks is pretty close to the optimal that I identify, but I would still feel more comfortable if the target were moved up uh, somewhat. But I think another major point is that this is far less than um, some of these academic studies call for, they call for a capital of like 25% of assets. I mean, if you, if you look at the bottom line um, in, in my study, you'll see that the, the benefits of crisis avoided uh, are in this, uh, this, this top line here. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the costs are this straight line going up. And some uh, of these other advocates say, or analysts say that we should be way out here at 25% uh, uh, capital to assets. Instead, I say it's optimal level 7 to 8%. That's where the extra benefits, which is crisis avoidance, yeah. uh, equal the extra cost, which is the fact that you don't form as much capital and have lower GDP mm -hmm. uh, from, from uh, holding more bank capital. Let me push you a little bit on the cost, though. The title of your of your working paper is "Benefits and Costs of Higher Capital Requirements for Banks," right. and our viewers can uh, can download it at, uh, at PIA.com. But but you know, with the issue of benefits and costs, having just come out of or at least a few years out from a massive financial crisis, isn't there a sense that the costs that they're intangible costs beyond what you can quantify in the sense that the long-term unemployment and the, the underutilization of resources that you've had over, a, a, say, a seven-year period. People even refer to, to the U.S. as having lost significant economic ground, not to mention other places like well, Europe and In the topsy-turvy way that this is analyzed, 
that's the that speaks to the benefits of capital because the benefit is the avoidance of the loss of output and the unemployment and all of that. And that's what I mean. My, my number for that is that uh, a, a banking crisis imposes an economic loss to the economy that's worth about two thirds of one year's full GDP. That'd be like eleven trillion dollars. So that's that's a huge number, and it counts ongoing effects. Uh, for, for many years. Now, some estimates are, are even higher than that because they assume these effects last absolutely forever. Yeah. But I think those estimates forget that nothing lasts forever. The, the capital that you would have created during that period would have its own amortization life and so forth. Uh, but yes, I mean, you are, you are definitely right that the intuition that these damages from these banking crises are really huge is right. And that's, that's already included uh, in, my, in my calculation. But it, it's also true, if you take a look at the, the relationship of the probability of a crisis to the amount of the capital the banks hold, uh, it's a very uh, sharp curve. Uh, the, 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 the risk drops off quite quickly as you get close to filling that gap from, from what, what might be the nasty shock and what you actually what you actually hold. So uh, I am already taking account of the the large benefits, uh, which is a, a terrible loss avoided uh, from from uh, from a higher bank capital. So is it fair to say that basically, it's there's a general agreement that capital was too was too, was too low before the crisis. The That's crisis fair to in say. itself proved it. But yeah. is it fair to say that you 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 want to fight against the pendulum swinging too far in the other direction? Is that kind of where you're headed? Well, I guess I'm saying U.S. regulators are. My basic position is that we could still have, uh, we could benefit from still some further move, and make the Basel target what the actual banks are doing in the U.S. now, uh, at least. Yeah. Uh, but that the desirable level is not these um, extremely high capital ratios, because the consequence of that, you, you you wouldn't get much further reduction in the probability of crisis, but you'd have just a straight line further additional costs of, of uh, reduced capital formation for the economy. Thank you so much, Bill. I appreciate it. My pleasure.